In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. May the Lord bestow upon us his blessing, mercy, grace, and wisdom, now and ever into the age of all ages, amen. Welcome back, everyone. Today is the second um, talk in our series on the Orthodox Creed of Faith. And um, if you've been joining us uh, this time, uh, just to remind you of what we were studying, we're studying the Creed, and we thought it was important for us to study the words of such an important prayer in our church and it reflects not only the dogma and the doctrine of our church um, but how God reveals himself to us through the scriptures through the fathers through the worship through the tradition um, we have received this uh, document but it's more than that <clears throat> um, and it reminds us uh, ourselves of what we believe and more importantly we need to remind ourselves why we believe these things and that's why we're going to study it um, in depth. Um, last week we studied the first part of the creed or just the first uh, two words um, and I actually I didn't um, uh, mention that uh, there's another word before we believe right but there's another word truly we believe um, that usually the deacon starts um, starts us off when he says the response um, in the wisdom of God, let us attend. And then he says, truly, which is the technically the first word of, of the creed. Um, and we'll maybe talk about that at, at another time. Um, but today, God willing, we'll talk about um, the whole first um, uh, portion. We believe in one God, God the Father, the Pantocrator, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things seen and unseen. <clears throat> um, but before we get into that, um, just a, a quick reminder of what we um, discussed last time. So um, last time we used the acronym PROMISE because the creed is a promise that we make. Um, and that's why it's recited on the day of our baptism or it's recited for us by the sponsors or our, usually our parents if we're children. <clears throat> so um, the creed is the pledge that we make. It's a reminder. Um, to us as we recite it and pray, pray prayerfully um, chant it every day. Um, it is our pledge of obedience to our Savior and to the church. Um, and it is our map, which we'll talk about in the next slide. And it's our identity that we have as Christians and children of God. It's a signpost against heresies. Um, and it's our entrance into the deep, into the mysteries, into a deeper relationship with God. Okay, um, and if you want to um, uh, kind of uh, remind yourselves of some of the, those points in depth, I encourage you to to um, uh, look at the lecture that we recorded last week. Um, so, oftentimes when you're trying to get to know someone um, you're, that you're unfamiliar with, or someone is encouraging you to, you know, meet someone they thought think you might be a good friends or whatever what do you usually do? You ask the same kind of groups of questions about them, right? What's their background? What is their name? Um, what family do they come from? And so on and so forth. That's kind of like the first category of questions that you ask. And then you ask about, well, like, let's say it's, if it's someone from history or a saint, well, what, what have they done that's so important or blessed or unique compared to all the other saints, right? Um, and then the third kind of question you ask is, well, what have they given to history or to the church or to humanity or, or to me, <laughs> right? Um, so I think these kind of three basic questions um, are a good starting point of how the creed can be divided. There's, there's many different ways we, divide, we can divide this, this creed um, to help us um, kind of navigate through uh, this uh, message of faith, right? <clears throat> so... Uh, some people basically divide the creed into seven points of doctrine, right? And, uh, or declarations that we have to make that we believe in before we can be baptized, before we can call ourselves Christian, and so on and so forth. But um, like I said, probably the seven is difficult to remember, but the three is, is, is pretty um, uh, easier to kind of accept. So who is God? Is that, 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 who is he, right? What is his name? Um, what does he consist of in a sense? Um, and what are some things about him that, that, that are true? What is he like, right? And then the second group of questions, what has he done for us? 
what he does for us now and what he will do uh, for us, right? And that's mainly found in the person of Christ, which will start, God willing, next uh, week. And then the last one is, well, what has he given? He's, and that's basically the last uh, couple of uh, phrases or the last line of the church, uh, uh, last li line of the creed has given us the church and the sacrament. So this is kind of like our structure for um, the creed as a whole. So God willing, today we'll talk about the first point. Um, and uh, as we can see, um, in that uh, first part, we believe in one God, God the Father, the Pantricator, creator of heaven, earth, seen, uh, heaven and earth, and all things seen and unseen. Um, there's, I think, three main takeaway points from this first passage, right? That the clarification that we believe that God exists, right? The second thing that God is one, and we'll talk about that. And then the last thing are, um, how do we define God? Or how do we, um, how do we describe uh, who he is? Um, okay, so God willing, this talk will go into those three uh, sub points. This is one of the oldest and the shortest section uh, of the creed. Uh, those who believe in one God um, are many, which includes other groups besides just the Christian groups. So it's easy for people to testify to this portion for the most part, um, except for like the pagans or the people who believed in many gods um, uh, or people who don't believe in God at all, right? It's a lot harder from pe for people to get from that point to this point, right? But in all honesty, most of the time when people, um, start exploring the Orthodox faith, this, this part um, has already been kind of accepted by them. Um, it's the other parts that we get to that are, are a little more difficult. Um, so I don't think it will be wise maybe to kind of like sit here um, or, and, and kind of like, because um, there have been whole courses developed and uh, tons of books that have been written on how to convince people that God exists, right? Um, <clears throat> and that's what St. Paul says. Um, whoever comes to God must first of all believe that he is, that, or that God exists in another translation, and that he is the rewarder of those who believe in him. Um, and so we don't have the sufficient language or comprehension to understand the mystery of God. Um, and every analogy that we, we can make or that even we will make is limited. And so we have to rely on what God, how God reveals himself to men or how he reveals himself to us personally, right? Um, and that revelation is based on the biblical um, understanding and not just human logic. So um, like I said, if you don't believe in a higher power, or if you don't believe that there is a God, um, there are, there's a lot of work that has to be done um, and a lot of study and discussion and contemplation, which I, I don't think this um, uh, series is, is kind of like the right one <laughs> for you. Um, but nevertheless, this is kind of like our starting point, right? Um, and, um, there are many people who explore the idea of coming to Christ. Um, and, but, and some people say the, this first step is the hardest part, which m may take years, right? And maybe we'll design another um, series to go further into depth that because it involves science, it involves debate, it uh, involves philosophy. Um, uh, and <laughs> that's not my uh, <laughs> cup of tea. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so the first point, God exists, right? Uh, the second part, we say we believe in one God, right? Um, and this can be understood in many different ways, not just that we believe that we don't believe that there is no God or we don't believe that there are many gods, but we believe in the one essence of God. Um, and there are plenty of verses in both Old and New Testament um, that, des that describe the unity um, of God. <clears throat> and uh, we see this clearly in the Hebrew text, right? Even the, the Old Testament, the, the one essence of God. Um, but it's kind of complicated, <laughs> as we'll see in a minute. Um, and I, I'm sure a lot of you already uh, understand this, but like, for example, uh, St. James says, if you believe that there is one God, you do a good job, right? <laughs> Step one, right? Um, and then the, the first hour of every day in the Holy Egbeya, the Book of Hours, 
right? Before even we get to the Psalms of the first hour of the, the prayers that, w- that we, we recite, um, the believer takes this portion from Ephesians chapter 5. Um, well, we start from the first verse, but uh, towards the end we say, we believe in one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one and um, uh, St. Paul continues by saying, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all, right? Um, so uh, for us, it's not hard to accept the idea that there is one God. But then when we ta- start talking about the Holy Trinity and that the three persons People say, well, is it three or one? (laughs) And our answer is yes, (laughs) right? Um, And I'll try to, uh, um, like, unpack that a little bit, right? Uh, But before we get to that, like, if when you study scripture, um, for the Old Testament um, prophets and uh, experts in scripture, this concept of having... um, uh, the Trinity, the whole, the whole concept of Trinity should not be hard for someone to believe. Why? As we'll see when we study scripture, like for example, in Deuteronomy 6.4, um, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, right? And when you unpack, okay, this, the word, this word Lord is Jehovah, right? Singular, right? There's one God, right? Um, but then when we say our God, it's Elohim, which is a plural, <laughs> <laughs> well, is it singular or plural, right? Um, and another verse, like in Isaiah, um, uh, God says, whom shall I send, singular, and who will go for us? Well, are you one or a plural? Um, again, the only way we can understand this is by, by the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Um, but from the beginning of scripture from Genesis 1, as we'll see in a few slides, um, the whole idea that that God is um, one essence, but there is more than one person. There are three persons of the Holy Trinity in one essence. Um, And this is where it starts. Even sometimes um, in scripture, you'll find God referred to as Elohim, plural, but the the verb attached to that noun is singular, right? So that concept of Trinity is already ingrained in Old Testament scripture, as well as new, of course. Um, as you see here in this last verse on the slide, First John 5, 7, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, or another word for Logos, or the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Some people say there's no uh, verse in the, in the Bible. There, there's nowhere in the Bible that says the word Trinity. Yes, but there's the, the, the theology is all over, <laughs> right? And this, this is one, one of the most clearest verses uh, to describe that. So if anyone picks up the Bible and says there's no uh, concept of Trinity in the Bible, uh, they don't know their scripture uh, with all respect, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, another uh, quote of St. Gregory, uh, the theologian, he says, to us there is only one God because the Godhead is one even though we believe in three persons. They are divided without division, so to speak, as he says, and they are united in diversity. The Godhead is one in three and three in one. So, and the three are one. So um, one way of explaining this is that um, uh, instead of saying regarding the Holy Trinity, it's one plus one plus one equals three, we can say, well, one times one times one equals one, right? Right? Um, and or like the example of the three lo- loaf leaf clover, right? Or that water can be present in three different states, um, solid, liquid, and gas, right? And not just water, but, you know, any of the elements, right? So the element is the same composition, chemical comp- composition usually. I don't know much about, you know, chemistry, um, but uh, you can see it in different forms, right? Um, so, so the water can take um, the shape of an ice cube or it can be steam, right? Or liquid like we drink, right? And all three have the same components, H2O, correct, right? So the same thing we can say, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three distinct persons, but the essence is the same, okay? Um, and the three are united, okay? Um, so, um, 
uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria also says the father is a father and not a son, right? And the son is a son and not a father. Yet the father is in the son and the son is in the father. So here there's unity, but also diversity, right? Furthermore, the Holy Spirit is supplied to the saints from the father through the son. So here we begin to see the interaction between the three persons of the Holy Spirit and how to distinguish who does what, right? So it's not necessarily about... Um, uh, the nature of God, because there is one nature of God, but the action, uh, different uh, persons of the Holy, uh, of the Holy Trinity uh, take on different roles when it comes to um, the interaction of God and man, okay? Um, as we can see here in this quote from St. Cyril. I hope I'm not confusing you. It's, it's, this is a big tack, uh, thing to tackle is to begin to describe God. And we'll see that I have tons of slides to explain how hard it is for men to understand God. Okay. Um, but I'm sure you already know that. <laughs> right. So the first part, like we said, the unity of God or, or point one, God exists. Right. The second point is that um, God is one, one essence. Um, uh, but in that one essence, there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each one of them is God and united with the other two. Um, so that we say we believe in one God, even though there are three persons of the Holy Trinity. Okay. Um, another example you can think of is that um, the, the sun in the sky, right? S-U-N, um, uh, emits light and heat, right? And both come from uh, that source, um, which is a billion miles away or whatever, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, as we'll see, the Father, God the Father, is that um, star so far away from us. But from the Father, we receive the Son and the Holy Spirit. Make sense? Okay. Um, and this is not my example, but uh, from the Father's, okay? Um, so... Uh, the last point we, we make before we get to the characteristics of God regarding the one God is that this is to remind us that even though we might say that we believe in one God, how do we live our life? And oftentimes people are what they call practical atheists, meaning they say that they believe in God, but their life um, reveals that they are fabricating other gods, whether it's idols or money or success or pleasure or even their own self, right? Um, so we as proclaimed Christians have to acknowledge that we, we put God above all else, even above our own self. Um, and that's the testimony of the true believer, right? Is how they live, okay? Um, <clears throat> so let's go to the last part, which is probably the most uh, complicated who who is God or what what is God like right and the theologians the the great church fathers have kind of categorized the, this into two main uh, divisions the first division is who God is and the second division is what God is not <laughs> right because sometimes it gets so complicated well that in order to go deeper into the essence of God, we just have to kind of start talking about what he's not, okay? Um, and those are like two branches. I won't um, bother you with, you know, the fancy terminology, um, but just what it means. So the first one is like, who is God? And we find this all throughout scripture. And um, <clears throat> I'll just mention a few. And I, I also put a few references here um, if you want to go deeper into that. Um, but this is based on how God reveals a little bit about himself to us from scripture, right? That he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is love, that he is the eternal, um, because he is God, right? He, he knows all, he, um, he has all the power, he is the all holy, um, and he is uh, the all good, right? These are some of the descriptions that we use um, for God. But it's kind of like saying if there's a soldier that, that is going to go into battle and put his life on the line, um, he needs to know who, who he's fighting with, like who the general is, right? Who is he fighting for? Who is the president? And, and 
um, what is the purpose for, for this battle, right? So we as Christians also have to do this, like, okay, we're soldiers in God's army, but who, who is God? What is he like? What is the church? Um, what am I fighting for? What am I fi- who am I fighting against, right? And all of these things help us become, you know, more impassioned to, to fight the good fight, okay? Um, and so same thing as workers in, our, in, in, a, in, a, in a company, right? They care about who the CEO is. And if he's not good character or something comes up, you know, which he does, it's an embarrassment to the whole company, you know, they might fire him, right? <laughs> or vice versa. They might fire uh, one of the employees who is not living up to the code of conduct of, of what the company stands for, right? The same thing. Oh, of course, we can't fire God. We shouldn't. <laughs> the, the only thing happens is that we leave the company or we leave the church, right? Um, and that's only detrimental to us. Uh, not, of course, the church, yes. But um, anyway, what we believe about God is what I'm trying to say affects uh, not only what we believe, but how we live. And it affects our relationships. And it affects the church in a positively or negative manner. And it affects the whole world around us. It should. If, if, if we are um, soldiers of God and living out the right faith, then we, we're spreading the light of Christ throughout the whole world. Um, or at least that is our, um, that is our command from, from our Heavenly Father, who is light of light. Okay, <clears throat> so this is what the, the, the first characteristic the, uh, the, of who God is. And then um, the fathers talk about what God is not, right? Um, and I just compiled a few quotes from, from the fathers to kind of help me <laughs> in this, in this uh, uh, task. So uh, St. Irenaeus says, The Father of all is far above. He is holy understanding, spirit, thought, intelligence, reason, hearing, seeing, light, the source of all that is good. Right? Um, he is, however, above all these properties and therefore indescribable. So we can say all those nice things about God. Right? But even saying that and knowing that is nothing in compared to what the reality is because he's God, right? It's indescribable, right? Um, and uh, Origen adds to that by saying, whatever knowledge we may be able to attain about him, we must still believe that he is far better than what we perceive him to be. Um, this is the beauty of God. Um, and that's just kind of like, you know, when you, when you get a, like a sample from, from a restaurant and then, and, uh, you so oh, that was very tasty. I can't even imagine what the full meal would, would be like or, or all the things on the menu. It, that's how it is when we taste the sweetness and the beauty of God. Um, and, and this is what the fathers are trying to relate to us. They knew him so well, but um, even the way they described it, it's nothing c- compared <laughs> to, to what the reality is. So that's why the church likes to describe God as ineffable. I can't speak about how great he is. I can't even think about how great he is. It's incomprehensible. Like we can't confine him to, to these limits of, of our vocabulary, right? Um, and St. John Chrysostom elaborates on this by saying, our knowledge is imperfect. I know many things in one way, but on another level, I don't know them at all. So we begin to know more and more, like as we study scripture, uh, as we um, go deeper in our spiritual life, but we're only scratching the surface. Um, and, and the rest of eternity in heaven is, is when we begin to unpack the deeper layers of, of understanding God um, in a good way, <laughs> right? So he says, in, I know that God's everywhere and that all of him is everywhere, but I don't know how this is possible. I know that he is without beginning, unbegotten and eternal, but again, I do not know how this can be. When he says unbegotten here, he's referring to the Father right? Because the son is begotten of the father, right? Um, it says the human mind is unable to understand how something that does not owe its origin either to itself or to anything else can be called the substance. I know that he, is, he has begotten the son, but I do not know how, right? I also know that the spirit comes from him, but again, I have no idea how. So there's some things we can describe how and other things we cannot. We use these terms because the church has given to us. We use the analogies because again, these, these analogies are helping us understand to some extent, but there's always a point where we kind of have to say, okay, that's enough for me. <laughs> um, I, I can't explain every nut and bolt because then 
God would be circumscript. Then, then he would be confined. And I would be able to um, understand fully God. And that, would, that means it would not be God. He would not be God. If I could fully comprehend everything about him, that means uh, he would be, sub, in a sense, subjected to me, right? But I subject myself to him. Um, okay, I think I, I, I make the point. Um, so um, let's go more into the, the words of the creed, right? So we see we believe in one God, right? Uh, God the Father. Okay, um, <clears throat> this is um, the first way that the church teaches us to understand God is that he is a father. This is a beautiful, probably the most beautiful description of him, right? Because um, if I start with almighty, then um, yes, he is almighty, but that doesn't help me in the relationship. Like, for example, um, I was reading uh, today one um, uh, story of, you know, a big emperor coming back from a war, you know, and there's a big uh, triumphal pr procession, you know, back in the Roman times, uh, whatever, um, and a lot of guards around him and whatnot, and there was a boy running to, to meet the emperor, and all the soldiers, you know, stopped him, He's like, what are you doing? He's like, this is the emperor. He's like, yeah, but this is my dad. <laughs> this is my father, right? Um, and so the same thing with, yes, God is the almighty, but maybe even before that, we should consider him as, as our father. Um, and uh, uh, this is in his essence. So again, this term is referring to two things. God the father, the pantrocrator, um, uh, but also God as father, right? And so what I just described is the second point. Right? <clears throat> but in his essence, um, God, the Father, has always been the Father, even before the Incarnation. Um, and we'll get to that maybe a little bit next time. But this proves to us also, or proclaims, the faith that the Son was always the Son, meaning that Jesus Christ um, existed before uh, he, he took flesh from the Holy Virgin Mary on the, the day of the Incarnation right? Because he was one with God the Father before all ages, right? So if he was one with God the Father before all ages, God, was, God the Father was always the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ was always the Logos, right? He was always the Son of God um, before he took flesh from the Holy Virgin Mary. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> so the being of God, the Holy Trinity, always existed as the Trinity, right? Um, to show us that because God is love in himself, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, the Holy Spirit loves the Son, the Father loves the Holy Spirit. So this is the, the ideal example for us as God loving uh, uh, us, but also within the Holy Trinity, we see the love, right? Just like within a family, we see the love, and that family as a whole loves other uh, people, right? Um, so, um, and the gospel, according to St. John, uh, helps us in understanding God. It's one of the most theological um, uh, of all books, uh, and especially when it comes to the divinity of, of, of Christ, um, we see this the most, um, at least from, compared to the other gospels, uh, right? So, in the first chapter, St. John says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten, so this is relating to God the Father, right? Because God is spirit. And no one has seen God the Father at any time. But the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. Okay, so that's, again, um, more relating to the role of, uh, of the Son. Um, so God cannot be Father without having a Son, right? And there was no time as the fathers teach us, and as I think it becomes apparent, but nevertheless, we have to reiterate, there was never a time when the father existed without the son or without the Holy Spirit, right? Um, and this is because the, the son, yes, the son and the father, uh, sorry, the son and the Holy Spirit um, each have their origin in the father, because that's the role of God the father. Um, but it's kind of like saying, um, going back to that example of um, the, the sun a million miles away, right? Um, 
once the sun came into existence, right? There was light and heat immediately, right? Um, but when it comes to the Holy Trinity, uh, God is the beginning and the end, right? So when there was God, which was the beginning, right? There was Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, moving on. Um, uh, Saint Athanasius said, explains this better <laughs> than my weakness. He says, for neither is the Father the Son. So we can't start, even though F Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, one God, we can't say there is only one person of God, right? There, there is only one person doing all these things, right? We can't say that the Holy Spirit was crucified on the cross, right? That doesn't make sense, right? Or we can't say no one has seen Jesus Christ at any time. No, that Christ took flesh, right? <laughs> so that's why he, he, Saint Athanasius begins to distinguish that the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. Um, and then in the second bullet point, he says, just like a well is not a river, nor the river a well, but both are one in the same water. Kind of like the example I was giving before about uh, ice, water, and steam. You can't say the steam is an ice cube, <laughs> but you can say it's H2O, right? So that you can, same thing, you, can, you can't say the Father is the Son, but you can say the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, right? Um, <clears throat> you can't say the Father um, rose from the dead, but you, but you can say the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, or God rose from the dead, right? Um, <clears throat> but specifically, when the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, hopefully, hopefully that makes more sense. Um, <clears throat> so he says, so the Father's deity or the essence of God passes into the Son without flow and without division. For the Lord says, I came out from the Father and have come um, into the world. Right? So um, this shows that, um, again, the propagation of uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit coming from or out from the, the fountainhead of the divinity who is God the Father. I think that's enough <laughs> theology on that point. Um, and probably one of the most beautiful descriptions of who God is and what God is not like, you know, um, is, you can, is in the, the first part of the Divine Liturgy of St. Gregory. Um, <clears throat> it's very beautiful. Um, and this is just a small excerpt from it. But here he says, no manner of speech can measure the depth of your love for mankind because you're God Father, right? You as lover of man have created me as, as man, right? Um, you, you don't need me. You don't need my service, but I need your lordship, right? You don't need me to be your, the son of God, but I need you to be my father, right? Um, <clears throat> and because of that, because you love me so much as a father, you created me at, from nothing. Um, and so it goes on, uh, and uh, maybe we'll unpack this a little more when we uh, go more into the, the, the second part of the creed or the, the bulk of it relating to the person of Christ. Um, but this was just, I think, one um, small glimpse of how the, ch the, the church teaches us that the concept of the relationship between God and man is, is found in the perfect father with the church unruly children, right? And how that father deals with the children and cares for them regardless and does everything in his power to, to make them more like him, right? Um, and so, um, uh, and more importantly, like when it relates to sin, like when the children are not good, does the father kick out the children? No, he, he does whatever he can. And like, for example, if someone broke the law, right? and the father was the judge, right? Sorry, sorry. And, and there was a judge. So, okay, according to the law, you, this, is, this is what um, uh, the recompense is, and you have to do this many years in prison and pay this fine, blah, blah, blah. But if, if the person on trial is, is their child, how, how is he going to, like, you'd be torn. Well, I, can, I, can I break this? You know, so it's kind of like, how does God respond when we sin? He responds as a father, not as a, a bully, <laughs> right? Um, and that, that changes our understanding of, of sin and the law and the commandment and redemption, right? Um, so this concept of God the Father is a big deal. <laughs> it's, it's a big deal because if we get the concept right, um, we look at repentance differently. We look at the church differently. We look at sin um, differently. Um, and more importantly, like the forgiveness 
is is not only easier to to attain but it's it's more desirable uh, because not just i don't want to make it right between god but i want to be um closer to him and 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 i i i want him to you know be proud of me and i and i want to uh enjoy my closeness with him as father and not um have anything that i did wrong um in the way and the same thing the father said things the same way okay and even more so okay um so i know it took a little bit more on that point um we'll we'll try to uh quickly go through the rest um pantricator god the father the pantricator the almighty right um the one who has power over all things right um god we know god is almighty and god describes describes himself as almighty and without uh, without god we can't do anything and nothing could be have been done to this whole world without without god um so um th- this is uh easy for us to accept i think um but just to keep in mind that the almighty um it's not just an adjective right it is how who he is right um and everything is under god's control and the more we accept that and understand that and know that the more we come to him for everything and trust in him in everything um and leave it at his feet so he can do what is best um because he knows and sees and and uh has control over all okay um and saint gregory the the great um well actually he, he's one of the late this is one of the later fathers in the western uh, church so we not officially accept him you know as as a father um <clears throat> because we were separate after the, the division happened but anyway <laughs> he writes god dwells in everything beyond everything above everything and beneath everything he is above everything in his power beneath everything in his providence meaning he's supporting everything right he's beyond everything because of his greatness and inside everything because of his subtle nature we don't believe in pantheism um uh, as a side note uh, some people those the people believe that god is everywhere and in all the creation right and he's the sum of all those things right that's a dangerous thing and be, for one reason because people who believe that think it's no it's only one that doesn't mean he's timeless right um and if if i like step on an ant that means i hurt god god like for <laughs> that doesn't make any sense right um he rules from above sustains from below surrounds from outside and penetrates inside it is one and the same god who sustains by ruling and rules by sustaining who penetrates by surrounding and who surrounds by penetrating so i thought it was a good definition of how the almighty can be seen and understood um i think we'll stop here because this is maybe um uh a bigger concept to unpack um but god willing will f- will finish who created heaven and earth and all things seen and unseen um next time just for the sake of time um and um then we'll kind of um start uh the person of the sun so just to kind of uh, summarize um we can't fully comprehend god right that's the nature of god but through what he does and through um a little bit of who he is and what he's like and what he's not like um we can start scratching the surface uh, of god right um and we focus more on the creed on what he's done because it's in the person of christ and um, which helps us understand these concepts of father right um and um the almighty right um so we don't dare to comprehend his essence but we can describe what he has done for us and toward us and how infinite he is how indescribable he is how um uh nothing is impossible for him so the knowledge of the divine essence um helps us not only in how we comprehend god but how we worship god right um let me kind of see if i can fast forward to maybe the last quote um okay here, here it is um saint basil um says his essence remains beyond our reach i don't know i do know that he exists right what his essence is i look at as beyond intelligence right 
Um, we just say one essence of God and God's nature is, you know, like we said. Um, <clears throat> but then he says, how then am I saved through faith? Right. And that's why the whole point of this creed is to, to grow deeper in the faith. Right. So worship follows faith. And faith is confirmed by power, right? The power of God working uh, in us or the power that is revealed to us um, through believing in all of these things, right? So that's, that's the whole point of why we're doing all this is to go deeper in our faith and deeper in our worship follows, right? It's hard to worship some God you don't know, right? Or don't understand. And so we can't, although we can't fully understand him, we can... Um, start <laughs> scratching the first layer. Um, and by doing that, it opens up a deeper connection and, um, <coughs> excuse me, more um, uh, deeper worship. So may God give us uh, that uh, blessing to know him more um, as almighty, as father, you know, as the one who created us and loved us more than we can understand. And glory be to God, now and forever, and to the age, all ages, amen.